Heart Beat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. One, two, three, four, let's go. It's Heartbeat. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. Hi, Heartbeat Alaska. It's Heartbeat. Oh! <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around. For genius show, it's the Elliot, the Indian, and the Eskimo. It's the Elliot, the Indian, and the Eskimo. Welcome one, welcome all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harpy Alaska Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. It's another great program. This program is on the issue of fisheries in Chignik Lagoon. I make it a point not to pitch native people against native people, one issue against another in the same community, but this issue is very important. Fisheries, very controversial no matter where you live in the state of Alaska. Let's take a look at Chignik Lagoon and how the cooperative fisheries has affected the lives in this tiny Aleut community. Then after we travel north and take a look at the Norton Sound King Crab Fishery. It's a wonderful show. Thank you for joining me. A few weeks ago, Heartbeat Alaska took you to Chignik Lagoon, where an experimental fishery has been in effect for the past three years. With the low fish prices and competition from farm fish, a few fishermen took the idea of a fishing co-op to the state to cut down on the cost of operating almost a hundred boats while at the same time improving the quality of the fish by producing mostly live fish. It was the belief of the co-op that this could only be achieved by requesting that the state put an allocation of 1% on the sockeye salmon. The state granted their request and this year the co-op with its 87 members would be allowed to harvest 87% of the catch and the competitive fleet would harvest 13%. I'm an independent fisherman, so you know we only have uh, an allocation of 13% this year, and a 13% of this fishery is, is nothing. And I'm thinking that if this particular co-op idea was such a good plan, uh, why does it need, why does there need to be an allocation? The reason they have to have allocation is they're not efficient. If they were efficient and, and were good at what they did, they wouldn't need an allocation. They're not efficient and there's a lot of waste inside that co-op. And I see more of it now that I'm, I'm in it, or my dad's in it, and I'm the one that's got the permit, so I have to go to all these meetings. If there were no allocation, we would just, everybody would, you just would keep there'd be this escalation, you know, you'd, people would be, okay, well, well, they're catching too much fish, so we'd have to add more boats to catch more fish, and then they'd add more boats, and we'd add more, so, so you'd be right back in the same position of fighting over the, the most fish as you possibly can in the shortest period of time possible, and that's the problem with the Alaska fin fishing industry, that's what all the competitive fisheries do, and that's why quality is poor in Alaska, and Alaska's gotten a poor, bad reputation for its poor quality, and that's why we lost the markets to the farm fishers, um, the producers. So it, it, that's what we try to avoid, is, is racing for the fish, um, because then quality suffers and we're right back to 40 cents a pound again. Many other issues arose from the formation of the co-op and the allocation placed on the sockeye such as the seine net that was placed across the lead, just below the weir. The state-owned weir counts the number of fish heading upstream to make sure enough fish get into the lakes and streams to spawn. This is called the escapement number, and if the weir doesn't get its count, the fishermen sure. don't get to fish. And unfortunately, the weir was not getting the count necessary to open the fishery as often as the fishermen hoped. 
Some locals believe that the seine stretched across the lead is the reason why the weir is not getting their escapement goals. It just wasn't managed right. And this here's not being, if anybody's going to try and tell me this is managed in the place, when you put a seine across down below the weir, <laughs> they're going to catch everything against it. Our idea that seine there in the first place is to get the fish going up there. How are you going to get 10, 15,000 a mile or so up to, or whatever it is from there up to that, that weir? It's impossible. The lead is out there, and they're supposed to have like 100 feet of opening in the middle. The other day we tried coming up, and that lead was totally all closed and, um, in the, the middle there where it was supposed to be opened. And what would that do to the fish then? Ah, uh, the fish can't come up here. Uh, it, it's like a trap. It's, it's literally a trap. Virginia Alec of Chignik Lake is just one of the resident subsistence users who depend on the salmon runs each year. We rely on subsistence heavily up, up here. That's, that's our lifestyle. I'm just merely concerned with our subsistence lifestyle. And, and I think if they're going to take that away from us, you know, that's, uh, that'll be another fight from me because I've been a subsistence user all my life. In August in particular, Chignik has had a history of over escapement. Even with all 100 boats or 80 boats or whatever fishing in the fishery, the escapement goal for August is about 50,000 fish. And the, I believe it's like the past 10 or 15 year average has been like 80, 85,000 fish escapement. So the first year of the co-op, here we were trying to be efficient um, using only oh, 10 or 15 boats, I believe, at that time to harvest the fish and try as we could, fish as hard as we could. We could not stop the fish. There was too much escapement. And I think the final tally for August ended up being like 75 or 80,000 fish. I mean, it's not a substantial amount of overescapement, but that was argued against us saying, oh, these guys are purposely letting the fish go by to prevent us from going fishing and, and it's a waste and we need to stop every fish and blah, blah, blah. So. So we went to the board and said, hey, okay, well, do you want us to, you know, you look at the history of Chignik with all 80 or 100 boats fishing, they haven't been able to stop the fish. So we proposed this gear change, this fixed leads that we said, hey, we can put these leads across the mouth of the river, um, we'll stop every fish if you want us to, and it's super efficient. We can, we can be able to pump the live fish, you know, harvest them and do this live fish program that we've been so successful with. And that way we stop every fish and we'll help fish and game control escapement and we won't have to throw every single boat in the fleet out there to try to stop it, stop the fish when we know, looking at past history, that we've been un unsuccessful in doing that in the past anyway. So the board of fish agreed. They said, sure, let's, let's create these fixed leads, let's try this. And, and they have been very successful, they work wonderfully. Um, and again, they are managed, you know, realistically not by the co-op, by, by the fish and game. If we're stopping too much fish, the fish and game says, hey guys, remove the leads from the water or lift up the lead line and let the fish swim by. And it's, it's amazing. We, they can tell us that and within, oh, it's, the, the, the weir is only about a mile and a half or two miles upriver from where these leads are. And it's almost within an uh, 18 hour period. They can tell us to quit fishing, lift up the leads, and let the fish swim by. And 18 hours later, boom, the escapement jumps up. So it's, it's, it's really a tool that the fish and game can use to manage the escapement and to allow us to be more efficient in harvesting the fish. You know, it seems like the fish and game has been really, really sensitive to that, and, and they've actually provided more subsistence opportunity you know, with the co-op. They, they changed some regulations so that rather than, I think it was before you couldn't, you could only take subsistence fish 48 hours prior to or 48 hours after a commercial, commercial opening. And now they allow, um, you know, non-co-op fishermen to subsist fish during any time during the co-op fishing and then vice versa for the co-op whenever the independent fishermen are fishing we can we can subsist during those times too so they've really expanded the subsistence opportunities and um and kind of and and and, and i think they've they've really really tried to help people out in that regard to provide as much subsistence opportunity as possible 
Unfortunately, a poor sockeye return this year has left subsistence users with a dilemma, and both fleets with very little fishing time. Geez, we were on limit almost the entire month of July. Um, we only fished the first three or four days of August. Um, I mean, the bottom line is we, we the total chignic harvest was, was about uh, 700,000 fish. I mean, that's the, the forecast. Fish and game forecast a harvest of 1.6 million. And, and in, in actuality, when it was all said and done, we only took 700,000. With such a low return and low escapement numbers, the independent fishermen were only allowed to fish four times this season. We got much less fishing time and the independents got much less fishing time. And it's, it's terrible, I mean, it's horrible. I mean, everybody agrees. But like I said, the, the payout the, the, you know, to the, to the co-op has been pathetic. And the, I'm, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know how anybody can survive on four days of fishing. And I don't know, our guys are having a very, very difficult time as well. And, and, and that's, again, not a factor of the co-op existing in Chignik. I mean, thank goodness, if it weren't for the co-op in Chignik, we would have had a 700,000 fish run this year, but we'd be fishing for 45 cents a pound. And under the co-op, at least, we're averaging almost a dollar a pound. And the independent fishermen, are, are they're not getting quite the same prices are, that we are, but just by the existence of the co-op, they're getting a much elevated price. I think it's in the neighborhood of 60 cents a pound, which when you consider that Kodiak is getting 52 on one side of us and that Ariam is getting 47 on the other side of us, it's a pretty darn good price. So. That's the reality. I mean, we, 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 you run the numbers on the average. I mean, the average gross earnings for a commercial stain operation in Chignik, if the co-op didn't exist, would be about 20, 25 grand. And you're talking everybody would have been owing the cannery money by the end of the season. I mean, the crew, should, crew would, have made, would have made no money. Um, people would be bankrupt. They claim we got a higher price. I don't believe that's totally true because I think the higher price was going to come eventually anyways. Um, we got less fishing days, but they won't let us have them all in one batch. I've asked for, I asked for that at the Board of Fish, and I asked Fish and Game, and Fish and Game says the co-op has to approve it. Now, why does that side have to approve something for us, is, is my question, you know? Um, and we're not asking for any more, I wasn't asking for any more fish, I was just asking them to, to give us something that, you know, we could cut some of our expenses, because our insurance runs same amount of time as it ever does because our days are scattered throughout the year. So you still have, we haven't, they haven't cut our costs at all for us, really. I mean, maybe a little bit on fuel, but you still have to have your crew here all year. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem to benefit us. It's created a hostile environment. You can feel it as you're walking down one of our gravel roads. It's, it, it hasn't been enjoyable. I think the kids are up against something that I never even had to worry about when I was growing up. You pretty much just had to, your responsibility was helping out in the summertime with the, your duties on the boat and working on the scene and helping your family out, you know, that's, and a lot of the kids are missing out on that now and I don't know what kind of effect that's going to have long term, but I know it's, the kids need something to do, as all kids do in the summertime, and there's not much to do in Chignik. So you take away that part of their lives, and of course you're going to have mischief. Some would argue that the co-op has saved many permit holders from going under this past season while others are convinced that the traditional style fishery would have sustained itself through these hard times. The debate of whether or not to continue with the co-op fishery will be decided by the Alaska Board of Fisheries. Regardless of the decision, the people of Chignik Lagoon have the challenging tasks of making the fishery work for them and rebuilding a community that has been divided for the past three years. I can listen. I can cook. Good. I can coach. 
kids with something to do are less likely to do drugs. I can drive. I can paint. I can dance. A little of your time can make a lifetime of difference. I can read. I can help. You can help. Call toll-free 1-877-KIDS-313 to find out about community drug prevention programs. I can keep a kid off drugs. I can do it. I can do it. I can't do it. I can't stop smoking. Oh, that's a big surprise. Maybe next Monday. Sure. Maybe next year. Why not? Yeah, you know, cold turkey. Cold turkey. Ah, it's no use. I'm scum. I've hey, hey, hey. Been scum. You want to know something? What? It took you a long time to learn to smoke, right? That's true. It's very true. Yeah, but I worked at it. What makes you think you can quit? I don't know. Just like that. Quitting takes practice. I like that. Well, call us. We'll show you how to quit slow. Slow for good. I can do that. I know you can. Thank you, everyone, for your help in this story. Thank you, everyone in Chignik Lagoon, for your help in this story. And we hope with this story that some light is shed that benefits the whole community. Let's travel now north to Norton Sound, NSCDC has a king crab fishery there. And please note, Heartbeat Alaska, Jeannie Green Productions, is much more than television programs. We're a full service production house as this crab infomercial will show you. From the cold, pure waters of the Bering Sea, straight to your table, the succulent flavor of Norton Sound Red King Crab begins here. The Bering Sea separates Alaska from Russia. The cold, rich currents nurture some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. It's from here that hard-working Alaskans fish for one of the most sought-after delicacies in fine dining, Norton Sound Red King Crab. I enjoy it. I enjoy being out in the ocean, making a living in the ocean. Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation manages the fishery and ensures that profits benefit the fishermen and communities that live here in the place known simply as the Great Land. Norton Sound Red King Crab is the only fresh Alaska Red King Crab available in the summer. During July and August, fishing vessels bring their catch here. To the state-of-the-art processing plant in Nome. Here the crab is carefully cleaned and cooked to perfection in specially designed cookers. Unlike all the other crab processors in Alaska, Norton Sound Seafoods is not a large, fast-paced freezing operation. Here in Nome, we take the time to do it right. Now this has got to be the freshest product that you'll find probably anywhere in the world because it's a small boat fishery and the boats come in on a regular basis and they bring in their, their crabs still alive. But summer isn't the only time to get out on Norton Sound. In the winter, with the fishing boats put to sleep, one of the most unique fisheries in the world opens up. The Norton Sound Red King Crab Winter Fishery. Meet Robin Thomas. As the winter sun sinks lower in the sky, he sets out from Nome to check his crab pots. Well, I'm gonna, we got the hole open. We use the saw to trim it and then the ax and then the duok. And then we'll pull the pot up and uh, we got our fingers crossed there. 
If there's nothing here, there might be some in the next pot, which you can see right over there. We've got eight more going out towards Sledge Island. There's a crab! <laughs> yeah, it's just under legal size. I don't know, Josh, he's pretty small. We better let him go, huh? When you are miles out on the sea ice and the darkness and silence of a winter night envelops you, the rest of the world seems so far away, and it is. But you'd be surprised how quickly Norton Sound Red King Crab is distributed all over the world. Alaska Airlines has scheduled jet service from Nome to Anchorage three times a day. There are also three other air cargo companies in Nome. When we have fresh product, it gets on an airplane right away. From Anchorage, most places in the continental U.S. are only a few hours away. Norton Sound Red King Crab arrives to your door in 24 to 36 hours. And before it even gets on a plane, it's sealed in a special box with an insulated thermal liner and frozen gel packs. You can have confidence that Norton Sound Red King Crab will arrive at your door market fresh and full of flavor. The Glacier Brew House is one of Anchorage's premier fine dining establishments. Norton Sound Red King Crab is a regular feature on their menu. Here we have some beautiful, fresh Norton Sound Red King Crab. Martin Johannes beautiful is a sous chef at the brew house. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, simply score the underside of it. And the uh, purpose of doing that is uh, primarily to make it a little bit easier for the guests to, uh, to eat. The other is uh, it allows the steam to penetrate the uh, the shell, obviously, and uh, heats the king crab a little bit uh, quicker. Keeps it nice and moist. Uh, the king crab is so sweet, so succulent, beautiful texture, and we don't want to disguise it or mask it or cover it up. Uh, so we're going to just put it in, simply in the steamer, no seasonings, nothing added to it. And then we're going to serve it with uh, a clarified butter. Again, no seasonings added to that. And, uh, and then we're going to sit and enjoy it. He knows Norton Sound Red King Crab is easy to prepare, makes a great presentation, and consistently pleases his customers. We got the, the crab all scored. So we're going to take it from here, put it in our perforated hotel pan. We're going to go down and put it in the steamer. We'll try to steam it for about four minutes. All right, here we go. And for four minutes. Now we wait. Uh, customers love it. Uh, overseas uh, customers, guests come in here and, uh, and rave about it, take pictures of it. Uh, just have a really good time with it. So we're really, really proud of the, the product that we serve, you know. Simple dish to prepare and wonderful to eat. So now that we've steamed it for our four minutes or so, we're just going to take it right out of there and we're going to go for the, the plate up. We're going to take this beautiful bundle of crab right here. We're going to put it like that. We're going to take this claw, put it like that. Martin also appreciates that Norton Sound Red King Crab is just the right size to make a great presentation. And here we have our clarified butter. And we're just going to put a little bit in that. Beautiful golden color on that. Looking for our vegetables, wherever they went. I'll put that in there. bit of vegetable and a little bit of jasmine rice. Oh, garnish of parsley. There we have it.
Well, our restaurant specializes in wood grilled meats and seafood, and so we like to have the best of ever, um, seafood and meats to offer to our guests, and one of which is the Norton Sound Red Key Crab. Um, it's nice and uh, the texture of the meat I like a lot. It's very sweet. And um, the Norton Sound Red King Crab is the only fresh king crab available during the summer months. And so we'd like to obviously have fresh seafood for the guests. So it's the best route to go. Norton Sound Red King Crab is a very popular, easy to prepare addition to any menu. And you can rest assured that the fishery is well managed and benefits the hard-working people in this remote and beautiful part of the great land. Thank you, Eugenia Siksik and everyone. Tom McGuire involved with this story and thank you so much for joining us. Join us again next week. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless you. We'll see you then.